the Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory be to you, O Lord. Jesus exclaimed, Come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. Shoulder my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Yes, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Matthew chapter 11. So, my dear brothers and sisters, we continue with our reflection of the Gospel of Matthew. We are in chapter 11, as I've been telling you. Chapter 11 and 12 focus on the rejection of Jesus by his own people, and that is the reason why chapter 11 opens with Jesus proclaiming woes on the cities, on the villages, that he himself worked many great deeds and wonders, as I said one third of all of Jesus' miracles were uh, worked around the Sea of Galilee. And he proclaims woes on his own very village, which he made his headquarters, uh, Capernaum, on Chorazin, on Bethsaida, places from where Andrew and Peter and the disciples came. Why? Because as we were told, they rejected not only Jesus, in some cases where the Pharisees rejected Jesus, but some, as these village did, villages did, rejected the very message of Jesus. They embraced what they liked, and they rejected what they did not like. They embraced the miracles, but they never repented. And Jesus says, woe upon you. And so the constant attacks upon Jesus are seen in Matthew chapter 11. And then yesterday we saw Jesus exclaiming, I thank you, God, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have handed over, you have given me all the mysteries, and no one can come to you except through Jesus. Very clearly, Jesus makes that proclamation. So first there was praise for the revelation. Then in verse 27, we saw the revelation itself. And today we come to the thanksgiving, uh, or the invitation, sorry, for the revelation. Come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened. And we are going to look at this. The invitation to come to Jesus. Now, there is a great tenderness, as I said even yesterday, in these texts. Jesus, even though he was upset and angry, perhaps with... Um, and yes, Jesus does get angry. There are some people who wonder, Jesus and angry? Please remember, he walked into the temple... And he made a whip. Huh? He was really riled up and mad. So Jesus being rejected, he must have been upset, definitely um, angry. And yet there is a tenderness about Jesus. In his prayer yesterday to the Father, he uses the word Abba five times. And then that same tenderness, which is seen towards God, is seen towards us today. When Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor. Jesus doesn't, as I say, say to us, fill up a form, stand in line, whatever the case may be, then I will check your number. No, no, no. The message is so beautiful. You can come anytime. I think Jesus never had office hours. I have office hours. Uh, our churches have office hours. Jesus never had office hours. And he doesn't even now. He says to us, come. The word is come. Just come. Come just as you are. Come to me, says Jesus. And Jesus really speaks as the personification of wisdom. In fact, one of the beautiful commentaries speaks of this. They say you can touch practically the feminine qualities of Jesus, the giver of rest, the giver of comfort like a mother to her tired children. I like that whole concept that God has both masculine and feminine qualities. But very often we've only portrayed God in his 
masculine. Jesus in his masculine qualities. Yeah, God never made us, uh, he made us man and woman, yeah, but he didn't say, hey, all men, you have no emotions. That's only meant for women. All men can't cry. That's only meant for women. That's what we have done. We have stereotyped men and women. And in many ways, we have stereotyped. God made us in his image and likeness. And we made God in our image and likeness. Yeah? We have transformed God into what we think God should be. Not what God is. So God also has these beautiful feminine qualities, which... Yes, all men listening, please, I hope you have some feminine qualities. Not be effeminate, that's quite different, but have, and some people even struggle with that, and we need to accept it. Uh, but, the whole point that Jesus is making is, embrace it all. Because God himself, Jesus himself, displays both masculine and feminine qualities. You can touch, as the Jerome's biblical commentary says, you can touch the feminine in Jesus. So Jesus makes today, in today's gospel, one more effort to win back his detractors. Remember, the Pharisees refused to accept the message of Jesus. And as I said, relentlessly you will see in chapters 11 and 12 how they go on attacking him till in verse 32, you will see that they cross the line and they make disparaging remarks even about the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, well, that sin will not be forgiven. But Jesus wants to win over his detractors. And that is why even in today's gospel, when he speaks, come to me, all you who labor, he's not only saying, come to me, all you who agree with me, but also, you know, hey, Pharisees and scribes, come to me. But in their head, they could not accept that Jesus was the Messiah. But what is so beautiful that I like in this passage is that Jesus, his message is for all. Those who agree, those who don't agree. And therefore, as I keep saying, our churches must be for all. Jesus never came to save one group of people. No, all. Sinners was a priority, but also sins. Yes, he came for all. Jesus also came for the Pharisees. They rejected him. He did not reject them. Our churches must reflect the ministry of Jesus. Our churches must be welcoming to all, even those we disagree with, even those perhaps who don't agree with our teachings, but are still by birth and by baptism Catholic. Because Jesus always includes. The church must always be inclusive. Now, this call of Jesus, come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, seems a bit confusing because Jesus begins by saying he invites us he says come to me all you who are who labor and are overburdened and at once you think oh wonderful all the sufferings that I have in this pandemic I don't have a job I've lost my job there's no money the children are driving us crazy at home I'm struggling with my wife and husband or whatever else you are struggling with let's take all of this now that Jesus says come to me and just dump it in him because he says come to me all you who are who, who labor and are overburdened, and he said, I'm going to give you rest. And then, it almost seems that Jesus has tricked us, because the next line says, shoulder my yoke and learn from me. And you're saying, hello, I came to you, Jesus, with all my problems, and now you're telling me, you want to give me your problems? You want me to carry your yoke? Yeah, I came to you thinking that you were going to take my problems away. So what does Jesus really mean? And I explained this last Sunday, uh, when we covered this text. You see, for the rabbis, for the Jewish religious authorities, the very word yoke for them was the Torah or the law. See, the first five books of the Bible, uh, which we call the Pentateuch, for the Jews, the Torah, for the Jews was the book of the law. This was the most sacred book. Even among them, there were sects and groups, some who religiously hung on only to the Torah, some who also accepted the prophets, but others said, no, it's just the law. And they called the Torah, believe it or not, the yoke. Because they felt, especially the Jewish establishment, the religious establishment, that we must place this law like a yoke on you, 
Imagine all of us carrying yokes, you know, instead of buffaloes and cows and other beasts of burden, we have a yoke on us. This is how the Jewish religious authorities looked at the yoke. It had to burden you down. And Jesus says, no, shoulder my yoke. That's why he says, shoulder my yoke. For those of you who have been watching these masses, you'll remember that when I covered chapter 5 of the Gospel of 5, 6 and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, I constantly referred to the hypothesis, the six hypothesis, where Jesus says to us constantly, you have heard it said, but I say to you, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Why? Because they had heard what the Pharisees and the scribes had told them, their interpretation of the law. And Jesus says, no, no, that's wrong. I am telling you that is wrong. They had, the Pharisees and the scribes had used the law to their interest, for their, for their, for their sake, to burden people. And Jesus says to us, you know what? Shoulder my yoke. Not the yoke that has been given to you by the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, I have explained this concept to you once before, but for those who are watching for the first time, I want to explain this. I read this many, many years ago, I don't even remember where, of this understanding of the yoke of Jesus. And I remember the author writing, saying something like this. It said that Jesus was a carpenter, so he as a carpenter, would have made several yokes. Yes, that was his, his profession. Now, how was a yoke made? A yoke was, very, was made in a, in a similar fashion that you'd make a bespoke suit today. Anybody, any gent getting married or anybody on any occasion, you want a beautiful uh, tailored suit for yourself. You don't, today we go and buy re ready-made ones, but Many of us from my generation always went to a tailor. You took him your cloth, just as um, the, the farmer would have taken the wood, or maybe Jesus would have selected an appropriate wood. So they would take their cows to the carpenter, just as you would take your suit material to the tailor, and take yourself. That's the most important, because you have to be measured. And what would the carpenter do? He would measure the oxen, measure them. Then he would send the oxen away and based on the measurement chosen from that, the wood that he was chosen, he would carve, carve out a, like a, a, a rough um, piece of wood with the yoke fashioned on it, very roughly done. Then in a very similar way, like how you would go for a trial for a suit or a dress, the oxen were brought back. And now the carpenter, if it was Jesus, Jesus the carpenter or any other carpenter, would take the yoke and then place it on the oxen to see whether, and listen to this, it was well-fitting. Whether it was well-fitting. If not, like as we would have in our suit, we'd say, no, it's a little tight here, make it loose here. What's the whole point? When Jesus says, shoulder my yoke, shoulder my law, he has measured us. He knows that we cannot bear a burden or take on a burden that is too great. He has measured us. And I think the Lord also trims our yoke. He says, the law that I give you is not a heavy law like the Jewish rabbis. It's a law of love. It's a light law. Love changes our lives. That is the reason why Jesus says, a new commandment I give you. This is my yoke. It is not heavy. He says very clearly, my yoke is not heavy. My burden is light. What I share with you is love. And this, my dear brothers and sisters, is what I want to end this homily with. That very often, and I know you'll find it strange coming from a priest, I find that religion has been made burdensome for a lot of people. When I think as to why our young people, and sometimes even others, are put off by even the Catholic faith, there are several reasons. Several. One reason can also be the person themselves. Yeah? Let's not rule that out. But let's be honest also and realize sometimes 
that the way we have presented religion, faith, Jesus, has often been very tedious. Um, there are several examples I can give you, but the way we approach religion with people is formal. I said yesterday to you that Jesus burst out into prayer. And what kind of a prayer was it? It took the formality of the Jewish prayer. I thank you, God, Lord of heaven and earth. But he made it his own Jesus by saying, Abba, Abba. He made it so personal. And yesterday I said to you, make your prayer. Become a prayer as being a chatterbox with Jesus. Just chatter, 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 chatter. Now, how light is that? It is beautiful. I know yesterday I get several testimonies. I'm going to read one now. But yesterday somebody, Cora from Orlem, many of you might know her, uh, sent me, she said, you know, I just went to the window, Father, and I, and I started talking to Jesus about struggling with groceries at home. And then she testified how uh, a student who comes, uh, whose child comes to her for catechesis called her up and said, you know, Cora, I know that you struggle with your eyesight and I, uh, you know, I just happen to be going to get groceries tomorrow morning. Would you want to come along? Boom. Prayer heard, prayer answered. And I think if we take off sometimes the formality in which we have approached God with and approach Him with honesty and with simplicity and love, I mean, look at all the saints. Look at all the saints. Look at our Blessed Mother when she approached those little children. She picked children for a reason. Not because their hearts were only pure, surely, but because of the simplicity of the approach. And who took those children seriously? Who? It took a long time. All the learned, the bishops of, of, uh, of Lourdes, and all of them around, the mayor, if you read the story, all of them with their wisdom, yeah, the whole might of the Vatican, everybody looked at these children with suspect. And our Blessed Mother spoke to them in simple words. They couldn't even grasp. The same thing happened in Fatima. We have made religion very often burdensome for others. And I know when I gave a particular example of the rosary, uh, please, I say the rosary myself, but the additions to the rosary, some people got a little upset. Nobody is asking you to drop any prayer. Can you make it joyful? Can you teach your children also to stop saying prayers and pray? And this is the problem today. We have made religion burdensome. And I don't find. I'm going to give you another example. If you ask anybody to, to say a prayer, nobody wants to. In fact, for many, prayer is burdensome. Just think about it. You, the minute you say, let's pray, everybody goes, oh. You say, let's watch the TV. Hey. But if you say, let's pray, prayer is not burdensome. It is a privilege. You are privileged to enter into the court of God, into his, in front of his great majesty and speak to him like he was your best friend. It's a privilege. We have made it burdensome. You know, many years ago, I sat on a committee where there were several high-ranking church officials. I'm not going to tell you any more. And we were, planning our, uh, we, were, we were planning an entire program. And one part of that program was a prayer for the whole of the country to, to say. We took a whole day to write the prayer. You know why? Because we were analyzing every word, making sure it was theologically correct, that it didn't ruffle any feathers. I remember that was the, that was the day I felt the most empty in my life, empty. And I just closed my eyes that day and I said, Lord, what are we doing? What are we doing? Jesus has come to make a burden light. It's a, it's a contradiction. He says, I have come to make your burden light. Yeah? I'm not, even though I'm giving you a burden, it's a light burden. And that itself is a contradiction. God wants to love us, my dear brothers and sisters. Teach people the love of God not the fear of God. Because when you love somebody, you automatically, and remember the fear of God is not putting the fear of God into somebody. The fear of God really, as in the scriptures, is the awe of God. That's how it's translated. That when I love you, I am crazy about you. That's the real translation of the fear of God. 
we have misunderstood these texts and so we put the fear of God, we frighten people about faith and then they grow up and they get wise. Imagine if you only taught them how loving Jesus is, how wonderful Jesus is and he is, that's the truth. When I was preparing this homily, the words of one of the songs came to mind and I said it to Jesus and I wrote it down. How sweet it is to be loved by you.